do that. Great. Well, good evening or good afternoon or good morning um, wherever you are. Welcome to the King's Russia Institute uh, online. My name is Sam Green. I'm director of, of the Institute at King's and it's wonderful to see so many of you joining us from here in the UK, in Russia, uh, across Europe and North America. And I think judging by the sign up list, even uh, in New Zealand, which is kind of cool. So about two or three months ago, as the world seemed to be getting kind of both bigger and smaller at the same time, my colleagues and I at the, at the Russian Institute turned to this kind of format as of course did a lot of other institutions around the world in an effort to maintain some sense of connection with the issues, the ideas, uh, and the people right, uh, who matter to us personally, professionally, and, and intellectually. Uh, in the week since the pandemic began, uh, perhaps inevitably, our discussions here, including with uh, Grisha Smolov, uh, Gunnar Sharafutinova, Marlene Laruel, Rudina Smith, Madeleine McCann, and others have, have focused very much on understanding the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on politics and society uh, in Russia and the, um, and, and the post-Soviet space uh, more broadly. Tonight, while the, the pandemic isn't entirely out of our field of view, though, we thought it might be useful to uh, sort of remember that there are other things going on, um, uh, including uh, a little matter of a plebiscite on constitutional reform in Russia that will kick off in about uh, 10 days time. So to help sort of bring us back to reality, it is my uh, great pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Uh, Greg Uden is, is professor of political philosophy and social theory at the Moscow School of Social and Economic Sciences, uh, better known to most of us as, as Shaninka, um, and a researcher at the New Economics, uh, sorry, the New School for Social Research uh, in, uh, in New York. Um, his uh, book, Public Opinion or the Power of Numbers, was published in, in Russian earlier this year, and he co-edited an important special issue of the journal Yavnos to the Public uh, on um, research into the Russian public um, last year. Now, the format is, uh, is as usual, so Greg will speak for about 30 to 40 minutes, and then we'll open it up uh, for uh, Q&A and discussion. Uh, the ground rules are um, specific to the medium, so I would uh, ask everyone except Greg to, to keep their cameras off uh, in order to maintain bandwidth, uh, as well as to keep your microphone muted um, until you're called upon in the Q&A. If you do have any questions or comments, uh, please use the, fat, uh, the, the, the chat function or uh, the, the raised hand button um, on your uh, Teams uh, app uh, to let me know, and I'll call on everybody uh, in turn. And please do bear in mind that this uh, session will be uh, uh, recorded uh, and uploaded to our uh, YouTube channel for uh, for posterity. Um, so with that, uh, Greg, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Sam. Uh, thank you for this invitation. It's a pity I cannot be uh, in in London, uh, but uh, obviously this is one of the reasons I'm participating in, in, in this series, because uh, many of us uh, obviously cannot be in the places we would prefer to be. Um, please let me check if I can uh, share my screen now. Uh, just a moment. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm just. I'm just trying to to find the, the document. Uh, not not a not a, a, an experienced. Uh, not an experienced. Well, we clearly we haven't ended in the same technological future that we were promised. Yep. Uh, Well, uh, I'm just, yeah, I'm just trying to get back to it. All right. Uh, now I'm sharing my screen. Uh, and, well, can you see now the, uh, the slide? Yes, yes, we can. Yeah. Perfect, perfect. Uh, yeah, uh, sorry about that. Uh, well, uh, I will be talking about a, about the the event that coincided uh, with the with the current pandemic, uh, and even was postponed because of the of the pandemic. I will be talking about the the plebiscite, uh, and uh, the plebiscite that is supposed 
to uh, put into action the constitutional reform in uh, in Russia. Well, uh, that's a kind of strange event. Uh, and of course, a very strange timing for, for this strange event. Uh, the, uh, the reform was announced on January 15 by the president. Uh, and until March 10th, uh, there were several announcements about the uh, new constitutional amendments. Uh, the idea was not to change the constitution. There are uh, the uh, chapters in the constitution that are protected. Uh, you have to convene a constitutional assembly to change them. Uh, and since Russia has no, uh, since uh, still has no law uh, uh, about the uh, constitutional assembly, uh, the uh, patchwork was to um, uh, to uh, change the chapters that are not protected. So a range of amendments was uh, announced. Actually, the the. The, the amount of the text of the amendments uh, uh, equals uh, a third of, of the constitution itself. And the last amendment announced on March 10th was, of course, uh, uh, was um, implying that uh, the term limits for Vladimir Putin are removed. Uh, those are not the term limits for uh, each and every president, but specifically for Vladimir Putin. And later on, the constitutional court uh, approved uh, all the amendments, including the the remo including the removing term limits, and, and even more than that, the constitutional court, according to the constitutional court, um, all the term limits uh, should be uh, subdued to the general principle of the popular sovereignty, which actually means that even if uh, Vladimir Putin faces the same problem uh, in, let's say, in 2036. The Constitutional Court uh, can already rely on uh, on the decision uh, made this year in order to uh, extend the uh, the limits uh, for 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 the current president. Well, the the amendments were swiftly passed by both national and local parliaments, which was necessary by the Article uh, 136 of the Constitution. And according to this article, the amendments immediately uh, take effect without even um, being. Uh, signed uh, by by the president, and still the president uh, initially declared that it will be a, a vote, a popular vote uh, on the amendments, and uh, he uh, is still sticking to to this plan. Uh, and of course, there is a natural question: uh, why hold a plebiscite uh, if uh, there is no? Uh, there is no legal need to do that uh, if, according to the Constitution, the amendments have already taken effect. Why holding this plebiscite? And of course, there are further complications. First of all, uh, this vote, this popular vote um, in Russian голосование, it is not an election, there is a referendum, uh, and Russia actually has no, uh, no legislation for this vote. For that reason, uh, the rules of the vote were incorporated into the uh, into the bill, uh, into the bill with the amendments, and it is the call. It is called in Russian uh, the bill, but the amendment uh, in singular. Uh, and this uh, this bill contains the rules for for the vote. Actually, uh, the whole procedure was created from the scratch, and incorporated into this bill. Uh, and of course, now we have the epidemic. Uh, and Russia is among the world leaders uh, in the numbers of, of, of the infected. Uh, and because of that, uh, the vote, of course, was postponed, uh, was initially scheduled for April 22nd, uh, later postponed, uh, and now uh, announced uh, to be held on uh, June 25th to uh, July 1st. Uh, so it will be held for, for seven days. Uh, and the the epidemic um, has uh, caused uh, some economic problems along with the falling oil prices. So there's a looming economic crisis in Russia as in many other countries. 
And of course, there is uh, still this question, why insisting on, on the vote when the epidemic is obviously not over, when there is an economic crisis ahead and, and um, this procedure, which has which is not um, almost not legally regulated, is uh, obviously not necessary from the constitutional point of view. Uh, and that brings us to a broader question. Why not get in read of the elections in general? This is a typical question for uh, many scholars doing the research uh, on countries like Russia. Now, there is ba obviously uh, a basic framework for analyzing, uh, for answering this question and for analyzing elections. Uh, it comes from the field of comparative politics, uh, and there is a range of approaches to explain why uh, elections and votes are still needed in the countries uh, which seem to be authoritarian. Uh, I'm mentioning here only several concepts, many more of them, concepts like electoral authoritarianism, competitive authoritarianism, or hybrid regimes, uh, suggested by the leading scholars in the field of comparative politics. And of course, the idea behind uh, all those concepts uh, is that those regimes uh, are not strictly uh, authoritarian. Uh, if we use the term uh, suggested by the, the scholars of Latin American authoritarianism back in the 1970s, uh, people like Juan Linz or Alfred Stepan. Uh, so th those regimes are not strictly authoritarian, uh, neither strictly democratic, of course. Uh, they have this, this composite uh, nature. Uh, they're mixtures of seemingly irreconcilable elements and uh, probably even robust mixtures. Now, uh, this approach uh, meets several important objections. First of all, uh, these regimes that are uh, characterized as hybrid regimes or, or um, uh, yeah, or uh, electoral authoritarian regimes, uh, they don't seem to use the elections and votes simply as a window dressing. Uh, they don't seem to use them exceptionally uh, or uh, solely in order to uh, gain legitimacy uh, in the eyes of uh, the the country, the the Western countries. Uh, the opposite, they seem to enjoy those electoral procedures. They seem to extend them uh, to um, to increase uh, the frequency of electoral procedures rather than rejecting them or diminishing them or uh, keeping them at bay. Uh, the second important objection is that the whole theory, even though it is obviously a step forward from uh, the initial distinction between authoritarianism and democracy, the whole theory still um, retains the, the, the teleological element, uh, implying that hybrids are still kind of transitional uh, types of regime. Uh, they are destined, predestined to transform into liberal democracy sooner or later. Uh, now, obviously, later than, than expected uh, back in 1990s, for instance. But uh, since they are transitional, uh, they are inherently unstable forms. So uh, they uh, are mm, predestined uh, to change to uh, something uh, looking more like uh, standard liberal democracies. Uh, and this uh, teleological uh, approach uh, doesn't seem to be uh, well grounded in facts. The, those regimes seem to be rather stable and uh, even more now with uh, all the transformations of uh, liberal democracies over the recent decade, uh, many scholars uh, start to believe that uh, those regimes might be indeed uh, the um, the examples or the patterns for the liberal democratic regimes to follow, or rather than the other way around. Now, what I'm suggesting is an alternative framework. Uh, I must admit that I'm uh, not doing comparative politics, and I'm not even uh, really an expert in, in Russian politics. I'm doing political theory. Uh, and for that reason, uh, when I'm looking at these kind of regimes, uh, I'm using the uh, 
the theoretical uh, current that uh, went to uh, went into uh, disregard uh, some time ago, but I think it's still very influential. The theory of plebiscitarian democracy. The whole theoretical approach uh, was suggested in back in 1920s, 1930s, in mainly in Germany and the uh, United States, uh, and many uh, influential uh, political uh, thinkers were involved in developing it, uh, starting with Max Weber, who is uh, normally credited with uh, coining the, the term plebiscitarian democracy, uh, and then uh, through Walter Lippmann to Carl Schmitt, uh, to uh, George Gallup, who was, of course, an important political technologist and inventor of uh, modern public opinion polls, and then all the way to Josef Schumpeter. Uh, what they were endorsing was not really a democracy, and therefore the whole term plebiscitarian democracy might be a little bit misleading. What they were trying to do, they were finding a way to keep the masses at bay uh, when there was no longer a way to disenfranchise the, the masses. It was particularly important for Germany uh, after the, uh, the First World War, uh, when, the, uh, when the, the country was faced with a series of challenges, was obviously, uh, obviously uh, facing the challenge of, of mass democracy, uh, and uh, at the same time, uh, those thinkers were trying to find a way to uh, a, a, a way for for a responsible leadership. Uh, they were not uh, actually uh, fond of of the democracy and not even um, trustful of the the very idea that democracy uh, can be uh, a, a real popular rule, uh, the rule of the people. So they were trying to uh, combine the two principles. For Weber, was the, the two different principles uh, of legitimacy, the charismatic legitimacy and the legal or rational legitimacy. Well, the legal or rational legitimacy was uh, associated partly with the, uh, with the German bureaucracy, uh, with the state apparatus, and partly with, uh, with the parliamentarianism with the liberal idea of uh, the rule by the parliament. Now, uh, Weber was quite skeptical of uh, the idea of the rule of the parliament, and he actually believed that that would uh, result in uh, irresponsible uh, leadership, uh, the country torn apart. For that reason, he suggested uh, superimposing uh, the plebiscitary a leader, the charismatic leader, the charismatic president uh, who'd stand over the whole political system, over the parliament, over the bureaucracy, uh, and uh, relying directly on the masses. So this is a combination of charismatic leadership of the president and the legal, rational uh, political apparatus. Later on, the, uh, the another way to, um, to put this combination was suggested by Carl Schmitt, uh, another important uh, German political theorist uh, who explicitly suggested that this is a combination, the plebiscitarian democracy is a combination of the democratic principle and monarchic principle. So this is a combination of dem democracy and monarchy. Uh, once again, not a, a transitional form, but a deliberate combination of the two principles. Uh, when leader is relying on the masses directly, bypassing the political system, bypassing the parliament, draws the support from the masses directly. Uh, and according to, uh, to this framework, mm, legitimacy should be gained through acclamations. So the sole function of the people in the system is to acclaim, as uh, both Weber and Schmidt uh, were put in it. Uh, the people should enter the political uh, scene only to uh, to acclaim, to say uh, yes or no, and mainly yes to uh, to the leader. And according to Schmidt, according to Weber, of course, uh, the modern form of acclamation are, are, are plebiscites. Uh, well, they can be called uh, elections, but uh, their meaning 
uh, is uh, is a plebiscitary meaning. Uh, people who are participating in those elections are basically participating in plebiscites. They are not choosing between uh, different candidates. Uh, they are rather uh, acclaiming to the leader. And for Schmidt, the modern form of acclamation is public opinion. He was uh, right in that uh, even before Gallup. Uh, suggested the uh, the whole idea of public opinion uh, polls as we know them today. Uh, <clears throat> that was almost a prophecy. Uh, now what happened to plebiscitarianism later? Uh, obviously, as a theoretical tradition, uh, it was bound to recede because of the bad associations with, uh, with the whole idea of, of the leadership, uh, of the Führerprinzip. Uh, of course, uh, in 1940s, uh, with uh, all the calamities of the World War II, uh, the idea of a system built on the Führer principle uh, would be impossible to uh, to support. So, as a, the as a theoretical tradition, uh, the plebiscitarian thought receded. However, it uh, retained a considerable. Uh, I would say subterranean influence uh, through some contemporary views of liberal democracy, uh, mainly uh, through Josef Schumpeter's idea of minimal democracy, uh, which is still very influential for how we understand what democracy is. And according to Schumpeter, of course, the democracy is minimal because the role of the people is minimal. The only function of the people is to uh, is to participate in, in elections and uh, elect the elites who would be the real rulers. And of course, Schumpeter in his 1942 Capitalism, Socialism and Democracy repeats that the main, uh, the main um, advantage of this approach is that it uh, stresses the role of the political leadership, once again, the, the Führer principle uh, in in the liberal democracy. So the people is basically reduced to participating in elections. Uh, the elites and the leaders are the real rulers, according to this view. And uh, of course, this view is still very important, not only because many people would uh, think of elections, uh, first of all, when asked uh, what, what democracy is, but also because uh, all those ratings of democracy are mainly built, not solely, but mainly uh, relying on the idea of democracy as elections. And this is what we're seeing in many liberal democracies nowadays. Uh, we're witnessing the growing electoralization of politics, reducing of democratic politics to participating in elections, which in turn leads to the decrease uh, of political participation and growing distrust in politicians. With, uh, with a rising hope that uh, a strong leader will come uh, relying directly on the people rather than uh, on corrupt politicians uh, and also on the various mechanisms of direct democracy uh, like, uh, like plebiscites, referenda and vote. And this is how direct democracy with a strong leader will flourish uh, through those constant referenda. Uh, I would say that this is uh, peculiar to many liberal democratic uh, countries today. But of course, in certain countries, we can see the radical version of it. Uh, and probably Hungary and Russia are uh, two obvious examples here. I will be talking mainly of, uh, of Russia, of course, in the rest of this talk. Now, in both of those countries, we can see a strong reliance on elections, on plebiscites and opinion polls. They're called public consultations uh, or popular consultations in Hungary. Now we have this uh, popular vote uh, in, uh, in Russia. Uh, and of course, all those uh, tools are very important to manufacture legitimacy, uh, to produce on uh, every week on, or uh, on a weekly or on every day basis uh, the impression that the leaders enjoy uh, popular reg legitimacy. Uh, that uh, they have the popular support behind their decisions. And of course, uh, in both countries, we have the strong leaders who are standing above the political uh, system. And the political conflict uh, inside the country is eliminated uh, and constantly reframed as uh, external conflict, 
uh, and the opposition is reframed as foreign agents. Uh, now, to understand uh, how this system functions and what might be the, the dangers uh, to this system, otherwise very robust, uh, I think we should uh, turn to the basic contradiction of publicitarianism. Uh, and that will help me to explain the situation with the 2020 plebiscite. Uh, the main problem, the main challenge for plebiscitarianism is that it needs the people both passive and active. Uh, of course, it needs people passive because it is distrustful of the people. It doesn't think that people should really engage into, um, into government. Uh, and uh, it is uh, very skeptical about the collective democratic action. For that reason, it needs people to be passive, isolated, and prevent them from uh, building uh, associations, from uh, building collective action. But at the same time, it needs them active, active on demand. Uh, it needs them active uh, in the times of plebiscite. It needs them not to stay home, but to appear on the political stage and actively claim, and then immediately uh, disappear. So this is the, the role of the people uh, for the plebiscitarian regimes, but it is uh, obviously difficult to combine this, these two ideas, of the passive people and the active people. Uh, and, well, this is how uh, typical elections in Russia work. Uh, you have a largely depoliticized country, the country where people are distrustful of politics, where they don't like politicians, including, of course, uh, Vladimir Putin, uh, uh, where uh, he is just the, the only option left uh, because the, the rest would be even worse. So you have a depoliticized country, a country where the, the, the level of civic engagement is very, very low, where the turnout uh, election, elections is very low. Uh, and this is what normally helps uh, the, the government to secure the, the results in these elections. Because with a very low turnout, it is sometimes as low as 5 to 7 percent in major Russian uh, cities, um, a little bit uh, higher in, uh, during the, the national elections. For instance, uh, in Moscow last time, uh, during the, uh, the mayor elections, uh, the turnout was uh, 30%. Uh, with the uh, parliamentary elections, it is slightly above uh, 40%. And uh, under the conditions of the very low turnout, it, it is easy to mobilize the, the loyal voters, you know, also easy to, um, uh, to, add, uh, to add the numbers through, through uh, explicit fraud. And this is how the supermajority for the incumbent is created. So basically, the 70 to 80 percent of the vote uh, is secured through uh, 15 to 20 to 25 sometimes percent of uh, the population support in the incumbent. For instance, now the, uh, the ruling party has the supermajority in the parliament, the constitutional majority in the parliament, with only 25% of the uh, votes secured uh, during the, the uh, last parliamentary elections. And similar dynamics is likely to occur with opinion polls, uh, with a very low response rate, uh, and polls perceived by res respondents mainly as a way to communicate something to Kremlin, or, to, or even to Putin directly. Uh, you have those uh, very high ratings creating this uh, plebiscitarian legitimacy. And those high ratings are in turn later used as benchmarks and even uh, the productivity indicators for the officials before the election. So that uh, the, the election numbers are manufactured in order to fit the, uh, the poll numbers. Uh, but of course, the plebiscitarian leader needs a real majority. Uh, and the absence of the real majority behind them becomes, behind the, the, the leader becomes uh, visible. This is exactly what happened uh, in 2018 uh, presidential elections, which were, of, of course, uh, obviously a plebiscite. Uh, and this is why uh, during the 2018 elections, for the first time in Russian history, 
the task for the uh, for the for the government uh, for the political machine was to secure 50 percent uh, not of the vote but of the of the general population uh, with the right to vote uh, and that resulted in a hyper mobilization uh, in many many people uh, being forced to participate in the elections um, among the sections that previously believed that uh, they have nothing to do with politics. Well, the uh, the result was secured through this uh, mobilization and pressure, but also uh, with, with the fraud, of course. The the real numbers were about 46 percent. The numbers, the official numbers released were 52 uh, percent of uh, the population supporting the, the president. However, that the outcome of that was the people started uh, getting involved into politics, started developing expectations. And immediately after the elections, the poll numbers started to fall. Uh, even before uh, the unpopular reforms uh, with, the, with the retirement age, the poll numbers started to fall and they keep falling up to uh, this day. Uh, now we have a uh, huge cleavage um, between uh, the uh, between the two ways to to measure uh, the uh, the approval ratings of the president. If you if you ask people who uh, what are the politicians uh, you trust, only 27 percent of them would uh, mention Vladimir Putin. But if you ask them if they trust Vladimir Putin. Uh, 67% of them would say yes, but uh, at the same time, 32% of them would say that they trust, for instance, Sergei Mironov, uh, a leader of uh, very, very unpopular uh, and fake party, uh, just Russia. So this is a huge cleavage now uh, in those poll numbers. Uh, even more than that, since 2019, we are witnessing two major splits in poll numbers. Uh, the attitude to president is very different uh, among two, uh, two parts of uh, the sample. Uh, the, uh, those aged 55 uh, or uh, older on the one hand and the rest on the other hand. Uh, the the elderly population is uh, one and a half, one and seven times more favorable to the president than the rest. And the second cleavage, uh, the similar cleavage, is between the TV audience and the rest, so the people who are uh, who, who are getting the the information about politics uh, through uh, television, uh, through state controlled television only, and the rest. Uh, well. And now uh, that brings us uh, closer to understand what is what is actually the need for the 2020 plebiscite. And the need for it is to restore a legitimacy through a plebiscite. And this is what helps to explain the rush. Uh, why holding uh, a constitutional reform uh, and uh, extending the number of the terms for the president in 2020 if the, the elections are scheduled for 2024. So uh, 2024 might be too late, even 2021 might be too late. Even, 20, even late 2020 might be too late as we're seeing because the approval ratings are falling uh, and uh, the general perception of the leader as, uh, having, as enjoying popular legitimacy is disappearing. Uh, that's actually uh, more or less obvious over, over the last two years. So this is where the, the urgent need to restore legitimacy comes from. Now we are seeing that uh, under the proposed reform, there would be a shift towards even stronger plebiscitarianism because monarchical elements are coming to the forefront. Uh, the presidential powers are further extended uh, to the detriment of the powers of the parliament, both the lower and, and the upper chambers, especially the lower chamber. Uh, obviously, uh, the designers of the new constitution are uh, believing that uh, this is very likely that uh, that Vladimir Putin and his party will lose the next parliamentary elections. This is why they are uh, reducing the powers uh, for uh, for the um, for the lower chamber, uh, but also to the detriment of the uh, of the constitutional court and the other courts. Uh, 
uh, it is uh, almost a monarchical constitution. Um, now we're seeing a visible split in uh, in polls. If people are directly asked about their attitude to uh, to the idea that uh, Vladimir Putin will rule uh, for two more terms, uh, it it is almost even. Uh, with uh, with people who are opposing this idea, opposing it uh, more mm, acutely uh, than the people who are supporting it. Uh, and now what we are seeing is a very ambition, ambitious plan for the vote. Initially, uh, the presidential administration was aiming to secure 35% uh, of, of the population. Once again, I'm not talking about 35% of the vote, but I'm talking about the 35% of the population uh, with the right to vote. 35% was already uh, pretty difficult, given uh, that the, the vote would be held in um, summertime, that there is still uh, obviously an epidemic uh, in Russia, and that there is general perception that the decision is already made. Uh, so for those supporting uh, the extension of the terms for, for Vladimir Putin, the, uh, the motivation to uh, turn out is actually pretty low. So that was already a, a pretty ambitious plan. But now, um, last week, uh, as uh, we can uh, see, the plans were changed. And the plans now are to get to secure 50% of the general population which is obviously the, the level of the 2018, because otherwise the impression would be that the support uh, got the support for the president got lower since 2018, which is true, of course, but that shouldn't be uh, shouldn't uh, appear as evident. Now, what are the, the measures taken? And I'm this is I'm, I'm coming now to, to the end of this talk. Um, what are the measures taken uh, by the administrations and what are the likely results of uh, the outcomes of this plebiscite? Well, first of all, of course, uh, the very idea of the isolation, uh, the self-isolation, as it is called in, in Russia, where uh, officially the current time was never introduced. Uh, the the self-isolation uh, because of the pandemic uh, and also a lot of instruments introduced uh, to perform the surveillance uh, over the of the population, uh, the instruments introduced during mm, the pandemic. Some of them uh, pretty much resemble the, 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 the tools uh, introduced and widely used in China, uh, not perhaps to the extent uh, of the Chinese system, but some of them uh, really going very deep uh, into private lives uh, of the people, uh, such as, for instance, the tools that uh, make it mandatory for the people diagnosed with coronavirus to uh, send uh, four or five times a day photos of themselves uh, staying home. Uh, and those who, who are not doing that uh, would be uh, yeah, would be fined for uh, for for not sending the the pictures. So th those instruments of isolation uh, are further enhancing uh, the the plebiscitarian logic, because actually the idea of the isolated individuals uh, appearing uh, as a multitude a claim to the leader is actually the the very idea of plebiscitarianism. Uh, the the voters are uh, prohibited, for instance, to uh, to hold rallies, uh, protest rallies, uh, forbidden uh, to uh, to campaign for and against voting. But the campaigning for uh, for the amendments is actually uh, taking place uh, as uh, so-called information campaign. So basically, the campaign against the amendments is, is now forbidden. Uh, so the, the whole uh, logic of atomization, isolation of the voters and surveillance is uh, um, contributing to, uh, to this plebiscitarian model. Uh, another thing is the extension of the electronic vote. Uh, it will be now held in two regions, but it is obvious that the plans are to extend the vote, the electronic vote for the whole country, 
Once again, it fits perfectly with the plebiscitarian model. You're staying home, you're not participating in collective action, you're not participating even in campaigning, you're not ho uh, having discussions or debates, you're staying home, and you're, uh, the only thing that you're required to do is to press a button. Uh, now there is uh, an unprecedented administrative pressure on the state employees now uh, these days to participate uh, in the plebiscite, and the procedure is extended to seven uh, to seven day procedure, which obviously makes it impossible to uh, for the observers to uh, to follow the uh, the fraud. Now, what is the the uh, the main outcome? Well, the numbers are obviously difficult to change. Uh, it is very difficult to imagine that uh, the, the plebiscite will yield the numbers that are not expected by, by the president. But the political results remain unclear. Uh, and I hope that from this talk, it is uh, more clear now that uh, what is at stake, what is actually at stake, is whether the plebiscite will help to restore the legitimacy. Will it help to create the legitimacy of the system ruled by one man, of the one man system? Uh, and this is something that is still unclear. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Um, so we can open it up now to uh, questions. Um, on your little menu bar in the center of the screen, there should be a um, uh, a little button to raise your hand. Otherwise, you can use the chat function to send me a uh, a note. Right. So there's a question here from James um, uh, Rogers. If you want, you mean to read the question? Do you go ahead and send me the full question? I'll be happy to to read it out loud to uh, to the group. Otherwise, just send me a little asterisk or something, and you can you can read it yourself. But in the interest of time, um, James's question. He uh, says thank you for the, for the interesting. Um, uh, presentation. He says, you mentioned the urgency of the vote, but given the closeness of the polls, are the authorities not in fact taking a risk, uh, maybe a big risk, uh, by, by holding it now? And, and if so, how do you expect them to, uh, to manage this risk? Obviously, you've, you, Greg, you've already mentioned uh, you know, a number of the things that they're trying in terms of extending the, the vote over seven days and, and using e-voting and doing other things. But is that, is that enough? Well, we don't really know if it is enough to uh, to produce legitimacy. It will obviously be enough uh, to to secure the numbers uh, because, uh, well, if the numbers uh, are not uh, high enough for the president, uh, there will be uh, well, there will be obviously fraud. But of course, they're not interested in a huge fraud. The idea uh, is to get more, uh, as many people as possible uh, to the polling stations or uh, deliver the, the ballots uh, to, uh, to the residents uh, and to get as many people as possible uh, behind the, the plan. Uh, well, uh, there are several tricks uh, behind that. One of them is that, of course, uh, I've, what I've mentioned, the numbers that I've mentioned, uh, the 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 fact that the population is split over the the key issue of extending uh, the the term limits for the president, um, it is it is not advertised at all uh, in the media. What they're trying to draw attention uh, to are uh, the promises to increase the uh, the the pensions, uh, which would be now constitutionalized, uh, and several other. Uh, I would say minor amendments that are not really uh, changing the, uh, the, the the constitution, but uh, which are quite popular. So uh, these are the um, the changes advertised. Whereas uh, the whole idea of extending the term limits, which is obviously the the least popular, uh, is rather concealed. Uh, and even more than that, yesterday the president uh, pretended that uh, the, the new constitution will extend uh, the power of the parliament, which is obviously false. Uh, so what they are trying to do, they're trying to conceal the amendments that are obviously uh, unpopular. Uh, th that's, that's one way to do it. The other way to do it, of course, is uh, to uh, remove uh, any tools to control the uh, the outcomes to control the uh, the real vote. Uh, 
there is a huge risk actually that the the high pressure on the state employees uh, will result in people turning out and voting against the uh, the proposed amendments uh, and this risk is high indeed because we've seen over the last two years that people who are forced to uh, to come to the polling stations uh, tend to disobey the the orders to uh, to vote for the for the incumbents. So this is still a very high risk, but it is uh, totally unclear how 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 you can control uh, the the numbers when the vote is held for seven days. Uh, you have uh, many many people voting at home. Uh, you don't even have uh, to report how many people voted at home. Because that would be one way to uh, to find out what was the what what were the real numbers if you compare uh, those who voted at home those who voted at polling stations. So uh, actually, it is very difficult to control those numbers, and I think that will be a combination of the three things: of disguising the real plan, uh, of uh, making forcing people to come to the polling stations uh, and threatening them uh to in order for them to 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 vote for uh, the proposed amendments and the outright fraud and of course the more fraud you have the lower will be the, the legitimacy okay thank you um we have a number of questions coming in i'm going to call uh first actually on my uh my colleague uh gulan sharaf uh from the, the russian institute but greg can i ask you to turn your camera on so we can we can see you as we have this conversation yes. sure yeah sure Yes. Hi, Greg. Hi, Sam. Hi, everyone. Greg, thank you very much for a uh, very good presentation, very important one. Uh, so as you started to talk, especially with the term, the terminology, I immediately thought back to Stephen Hansen's work, which I've now opened. It was published in 2011. And you might not have seen it, I don't know, because it came out in the weird place, the Annals of the American Academy of Political and Social Science, which is not usually what we are always reading, so it's quite unusual. But he used the term plebiscitarian patrimonialism in Putin's Russia, legitima legitimating authoritarianism in a post-ideological era where he developed very similar ideas. So I guess the, you know, one potential question with regard to this is what you know, we, so the, we, we agree on plebiscitarian. What other term do we use? Do we add democracy to it? Do we add authoritarianism? Do we add patrimonialism? And does it matter? And I had a second question, uh, but I think you answered it, uh, I think, uh, in your previous um, uh, comment. But it's about, you know, the. I think there is a very... Um, uh, uh, careful balancing that say the presidential administration needs to do in combining this mobilization forced mobilization with some type of um, carrots to induce people with some type of persuasion and convincing because otherwise in the situation when there is a very strong opinion that maybe he shouldn't have even followed through with the idea of uh, voting forcing people to come out and vote is just an extra reminder to people of uh, you know of their frustrations with authorities this extra thing that might become you know, a focal point where people might, in a way, quote unquote, revolt against the authorities. So, um, you know, I think you also mentioned about this um, uncertainty of the outcomes. And if 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 we do agree on this idea of uncertainty of outcomes, I mean, uh, then um, what don't we know if the Kremlin is following through? You know, if the outcomes are uncertain or are we certain about the outcomes in terms of the impact on the society, in terms of the impact on uh, after post plebiscite mobilization against authorities? You know, it's like it, it's like there is this bind for the Kremlin if um, uh, if if they go through with it, but they're uncertain about what it will cause, then why are they doing it? Uh, if they're not certain about the outcomes after the plebiscite, not the numbers that they might secure through fraud or other things. Anyway, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, uh, thank you so much, uh, Gulnas. Well, uh, first of all, um, thank you for the for the uh, for the tip. I will, um, yeah, for this this hint at, at Hansen's paper. Uh, I will check it uh, once again. I, as I confessed, I'm not a, a Russian politics uh, scholar, so I'm not doing Russian politics. So I might have missed something. But actually, in Russia, uh, in the the scholars who are writing in Russian uh, have. Uh, mentioned the the idea of plebiscitarianism several times. Uh, first of them was uh, probably Valery Fedorov, who is uh, running the um, the major uh, polling agency. Uh, and he's uh, very much aware of, uh, of the meaning of the public opinion polling uh, for producing the legitimacy for this system. So he, he was probably the first to, to call it uh, plebiscitarian uh, democracy, uh, even though uh, neither neither further nor other people who are mentioned plebiscitarianism never um, developed the uh, the idea and uh, this kind of description of the system. Uh, well, the 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 question is, of course, uh, why do we call it democracy? Why why, why wouldn't we call it uh, authoritarianism? Uh, well, first of all, I think that uh, authoritarianism is a very problematic term uh, since it has uh, all, all this legacy behind it, uh, all the legacy of uh, Latin American juntas uh, who are actually authoritarian. Uh, what we are seeing now uh, is a very smart way to understand democracy. Uh, so why I would... Um, well, I'm I'm kind of I'm kind of trying to uh, to conceal the term democracy in public talks uh, in in uh, for in in a talks for for the white pub for the white public the wider public uh, because I, I of course I'm I'm not thinking that I'm, I'm not claiming it and I'm not believing that this is a democracy uh, as I've mentioned the thinkers who coined the whole framework uh, they were uh, deliberately anti-democratic uh, and of course calling it democracy uh, is a sham. Uh, but what is, I think, really important uh, is that it is also not that uh, easy to simply to discard the word democracy here, because uh, the the whole case of Russia points at something very, very important uh, in the core of contemporary liberal democracy. Well, Russia was basically uh, much, uh, much in the same way as Germany in uh, in nineteen twenties was a country that first introduced uh, the, the mass democracy, uh, the elections. Uh, and uh, it was smart enough to, to hack the elections, to, uh, to, to uh, learn how to use the elections in order to support and even strengthen uh, the power of, of the strong leader. Uh, basically to make the whole system much less democratic. And since uh, the elections are playing such a prominent role in contemporary liberal democracies, to the detriment of uh, all other forms of political participation, uh, and we are, that, that's basically what we are witnessing in, in many countries in Western Europe, in North America, uh, people are getting uh, disappointed about the liberal democracy. Uh, and elections are uh, playing... A uh, crucial role now in shaping our democratic imaginations. Well, when we're trying to think of how how should we repair democracy, how should we restore democracy, uh, too often perhaps uh, the idea of holding a vote, of holding plebiscites, of uh, of voting through through internet, voting online, of holding a larger vote would would come to our minds. And this, I think, is really important because uh, from that point of view, Russia is not a uh, um, an underdeveloped liberal democracy, but perhaps an overdeveloped liberal democracy, uh, to the extent that uh, many other countries are following in the footsteps of Russia. Uh, and liberal democracy, uh, the way it, it, it has taken the plebiscitarian direction, is probably, uh, has probably taken the Russian way. This is why I think many of the dirty techniques developed uh, in Russia, such as internet trolls or manufacturing the legitimacy through polling, those techniques are widely used in uh, in many other liberal democratic countries, just because they are pointed a very, very important vulnerability uh, in the core of contemporary liberal democratic regimes. The, the vulnerability of identifying liberal democracy with minimal democracy, liberal democracy with, with a vote. Uh, 
yeah, uh, and now uh, about about carrots. It's actually there. There will be a, a few more carrots. First of all, probably the president will announce uh, the direct payments to the people. This is something that he has not done uh, during the whole uh, the whole period of the epidemic. Uh, and that, of course, created discontent because uh, many people in Russia know that uh, these things were done. Uh, even you know, something like universal basic income was introduced in many countries in Western Europe and North America. This hasn't been done in uh, uh, in Russia. But probably there will be a, a universal payment or something like that. So there will be carrots. Uh, yet another carrot is uh, a, a military parade that will be held just before the vote. And it is also uh, meant to draw the the militarized audience uh, to support uh, to support his plan. So there will be a couple of uh, more carrots. But I agree, of course, that uh, that might be uh, not enough to to secure uh, to secure the outcome. So the question, the answer to the question, why are they doing it, is simply that they, there is no no other option left. Because recently we have too many. Uh, you know, too many alternative representations of Russian society pointing to the fact that uh, Vladimir Putin is no longer uh, uh, a leader standing above the system, but probably is reduced to the standing of uh, of the leader of the substantial but still limited part of the electorate. And this is something he ha he doesn't manage to to do. He it simply cannot uh, play competitive politics. What he can do is play a plebiscitarian leader who is above the system, who has no opponents. Uh, in the recent polls, we can see that in substantive uh, sectors of the population, substantive portions of the population, the popularity of uh, Vladimir Putin is now comparable to popularity of, of people like Alexei Navalny. Uh, not nationwide, but in substantive sectors. Uh, in young sectors, in in Moscow, in some some other sectors. This is why uh, this is probably the, the last moment to uh, to impose this libertarian legitimacy on the people once again. Okay, um, thank you for that. There's a lot going on in there that I want to uh, unpack a bit more. We also have a lot of questions. Um, so uh, William um, writes, sort of picking up on you were talking about carrots. He uh, proposes another. Uh, uh, potential stick, which is is to wonder whether or not we seem to be seeing related, maybe to the plebiscite, um, uh, a crackdown on uh, on independent media. Um, so he, you know, um, uh, says he's noticed a number of journalists at at, at opposition or formerly opposition newspapers um, uh, resigning in recent days. But also, we, you know, we've seen the news uh, today of the finally appointing the new um, uh, editor-in-chief of, of, of Vietnamese and, 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 and other things in the in the media space, right? So is there, um, uh, do you see, I suppose, an attempt to uh, impose further control, not just on individuals, but on, on, on this space in, in general? Uh, well, there, there might be a uh, prospect of a, cra of a real crackdown on independent media. Of course, what's happening with now with the uh, Vietnamese newspaper uh, is uh, is very troubling uh, to to a wide audience because Vietnamese was a very uh, influential newspaper, uh, probably one of the most influential newspaper, uh, relatively independent, uh, with a very high quality journalism, uh, with its own ethical code. Uh, which is really important in Russia. Uh, so the crackdown on Vietnamese the newspaper uh, is uh, is an important event. But I actually wouldn't um, I wouldn't say that uh, a crackdown of uh, on the newspapers would uh, would be a way to save the the situation for uh, for Putin, because once again uh, the the real cleavage right now is between uh, the TV audience and the people who are increasingly going online, uh, including, of course, those who are still watching some TV, but who are uh, who have uh, the, the multi-channel mode of, uh, of information, of uh, getting the information about, about politics. Uh, and that's very problematic uh, for Putin, because uh, basically the problem with the, with the TV is that that it follows an outdated mode of uh, of communication with the with the audience, um, 
it is now no secret that uh, one of the most important, uh, well, the, the actually the, the most important part of the audience of the TV channels is Vladimir Putin himself. So they are producing a picture for himself. Uh, they are producing a picture that uh, he should uh, react to positively. And this is a very important feedback for them. But uh, his own way of, um, his own, I would say, political style or even lifestyle is getting more and more outdated. Well, one of the things that many people are, might be aware of is that he's not an, an internet user at all. And he's, he has repeated in that. And that's, of course, alienating for, uh, for more and more people in Russia, particularly in younger generations, but uh, uh, also for, uh, for different age cohorts. Uh, so that's important. Uh, the way TV uh, channels are losing their audience because they, they are still uh, producing their content for uh, Vladimir Putin and people from his elite. And that's, that's actually an impasse. Uh, either they uh, completely uh, change the, the approach to, uh, to producing the, the TV content uh, and, and lose the, their, their, main, um, their main audience, uh, which is Putin's uh, pretty aged uh, elite, or they lose uh, their share uh, of the audience. And this is exactly what is happening now. So I think that uh, in order to... Um, to stop those tendencies, uh, a crackdown on the newspapers uh, would, wouldn't be enough. Uh, a real uh, crackdown on the online media would be necessary. So either uh, building a, a firewall uh, after the Chinese uh, example, or perhaps, um, well, they, 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 they're uh, thinking of uh, something like uh, um, providing um, free internet access uh, to the whole population on the condition that uh, the only sites that would be available to the population are the state control websites. That might work, I don't know, but that, that's, uh, that, that's interesting. Uh, crackdown on newspapers, I don't think it will do. Okay, okay. Um, so, um, so uh, uh, next on the, next on the list, uh, Rosen uh, Jagalov writes, um, of the, of the two strategies advocated by different opposition groups, in other words, to, to boycott the, the vote or to come out and vote no, um, uh, if, you know, if your object was to challenge uh, the ability of the plebiscite to create legitimacy, what uh, would you expect would be most effective? Well, this time I think uh, this question totally lost any, 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 any sense. Uh, and why so? Uh, precisely because uh, there is no way to uh, to do independent uh, control of, of the real numbers. During the previous uh, votes and elections, there was at least uh, a limited opportunity to uh, control for the fraud. Well, there, there's no, of course, there, there's no way to uh, to change the official results, but uh, there is a way to provide alternative results, at least in part of the country, or estimate the amount of the fraud. Uh, and that, of course, was a huge blow for, for the legitimacy. Actually, it was the, the, the cause for the 2011 protests. Uh, and uh, it created a lot of trouble for, uh, for the administration. Now, uh, that is, uh, is almost impossible. And for that reason, uh, it is... Mm, it is it is difficult to call the people to uh, to vote no, even though uh, once again uh, it is very likely that the the number of people uh, showing up and voting no will be much higher than expected, uh, because the 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 fact that they are forced to do so and the general unpopularity of the uh, of the whole. Uh, of the whole reform in, in, in white sectors of the population, it, it is pretty high. Uh, so many more people than expected might uh, turn out and, and, and say no. But then the question is, how do you make them evident? How do you represent them? Uh, so for that reason, I don't think there, there is any difference between those two options, because uh, the, the, real, the, the, the real indicator that will uh, matter is the uh, the percentage of those voting yes from the from the general population. Uh, in that sense, those who voted no, those who uh, decided to abstain, 
they will be pulled uh, in a different port. Uh, for that reason, I don't think uh, there is much uh, sense in, in this discussion. And um, basically, I would say that uh, main opposition forces uh, are uh, already uh, in agreement that the discussion makes no sense this time. Uh, some of them would rather uh, favor uh, voting against uh, the amendments. Others would rather favor uh, abstaining from the vote altogether. But generally, there is no uh, there is no discussion between uh, major opposition forces, starting with Communist Party, and that's actually very important. That if for the first time for, uh, for in a very very long uh, time, the Communist Party uh, is uh, opposing a major uh, move from the president. Uh, for many, many years, they were playing this game of uh, opposing the, the minor things and supporting the, the major stuff. Now they are, of course, opposing something which is very, very important for the president, and that's why he was arguing uh, with them uh, just yesterday. So from the Communist Party to um, what, what we call the, the unsystemic opposition, uh, there is no major uh, debate over that. What I think uh, might uh, make sense to do uh, is to hold a large opinion poll uh, with uh, with this uh, with this question uh, act, uh, asked uh, in an in an open manner. If you support uh, the removal of the limit terms for the president, and that would create a different uh, image of the society. That I think might uh, might be a game changer uh, to a certain extent. So fight, fight with the side, with the side. Um, so uh, Rika has a question which actually picks up on, on, on something I wanted to ask about in, in the broader sort of theory of parliamentary uh, democracy, um, which is where the elites fit in, right? Um, so Rika's question is, uh, you know, is the referendum a way to legitimize it for Putin to legitimize himself, not just in the eyes of the public, but also in the eyes of, of elites? Is it a way to, to, to prove um, through his associates, his friends, his business partners, others in the in the system, in the regime, that um, that he's still got it, uh, in other words. And I think that, that begs a bigger, a bigger question, a bigger question about where where elites fit into this system that, that as you described, you really very much had had Putin at the top and had you know the masses at the bottom and, and very little in between. Yeah, uh, obviously, that's that's a very important uh, addition, and it's a, it, in any, it doesn't in any way contradict what uh, what I've uh, said earlier. Uh, obviously, uh, the the elites and the whole apparatus uh, it obeys uh, Vladimir Putin precisely because everyone believes that he's uh, the, he's uh, a popular leader, actually the the only leader. For uh, f both for the elites and for the whole bureaucratic apparatus, uh, the the only ground to to obey the president in this system that because the is uh, is the ch the is the chief. Uh, we call it начальник in, in Russia. Uh, so the the question for them is who's the chief, uh, and if you're not the chief, uh, if you for instance if you have like 35 percent of of the vote behind you. And there is a guy standing next to you who has like 27%. Why obeying someone who has 20, 35% against someone who has 27%? It might change uh, tomorrow. So the only reason to obey the, the, the leader is that he's the chief and will remain the chief, uh, presumably for, if not forever, then for a long time. So uh, the why why was uh, kind of restricting the, uh, the 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 system to the leader and the and the masses is to demonstrate how the legitimacy is produced because I think it's very important that the the legitimacy in this system has a democratic nature. I'm not once again I'm saying it is democracy, but it is a democratic legitimacy. Everyone's obeying the leader because everyone believes. That he is a, he, he's a democratic uh, leader. He's, he's supported by the people. Uh, so in in that sense, yes, uh, I think that uh, many cracks might appear uh, in inside the regime. Uh, and actually, the the dissent from the Communist Party is one of probably of the first cracks. Uh, well, the Communist Party is not a very important part of the regime, but given the the left leaning. Uh, attitudes growing uh, in the population, 
that might uh, have certain repercussions. So uh, many cracks might appear in the regime if uh, there is uh, no longer plebiscitarian legitimacy. Mm -hmm. That leads also, as you mentioned, the need to manage sort of different uh, demands from within the, the electorate uh, into uh, Rafael Marshall's question. Um, and guys, you know, you, you're free to, to ask your own question, so you can just raise a hand and I'll, I'll you know, turn on your microphone and, and you can talk. But Raphael's question is, as you mentioned, uh, there's been an attempt to maybe obscure some of the more overtly political aspects, particularly the term limits um, uh, aspects of the constitutional reform right behind things about pension and, and other socioeconomic issues and, and, and values issues. Um, is there a danger that um, if they effectively conceal, Raphael asks, the, the, the key issue of, of Putin continuing in, in office, that this actually um, reduces the, the extent to which the plebiscite confers legitimacy? Well, I think it does. I think it, it, it does, but I don't uh, know to, to which extent. Uh, well, uh, the, the whole plan seems to be, you know, um, uh, rhetorically rather weak, uh, even though uh, there are many amendments, so-called popular amendments, or many people call them even populist amendments, uh, built into this uh, project, into this constitutional reform. The whole plan is rather rhetorically weak because even the president himself, addressing the parliament on March 10th, admitted that uh, there should be uh, a change uh, at some point. Actually, that this is healthy for the system to have a change uh, of the president. But uh, for some reason, uh, we are not uh, adolescent enough uh, to have this kind of system. And this is weak. I mean, uh, it's one thing to insist on the necessity to have a sole leader without uh, without any change in power. And quite the other thing to admit that we need actually this kind of change. But after me having presided of the country for 20 years, we are not uh, adolescent enough uh, for, uh, for that. So I think it, it, will, uh, it will actually damage uh, the legitimacy, particularly once again among the, the younger uh, age cohorts uh, who are basically tired of the president. Uh, among the elderly population, many people would say uh, in plain words, well, let us die under Putin and then uh, do whatever you want, just because they are very, very scared of, uh, of any kind of change. But among the younger courts, people are tired of him, uh, and that's, that's growing. Uh, I don't think that there is any way, any reasonable way to stop it completely, even though I can imagine he can uh, introduce some measures or policies or political moves uh, to put it off the agenda temporarily. But otherwise, uh, I think the, the whole rhetorical construction, uh, the whole idea of, you know, inevitability of him staying in power, uh, despite the despite the fact that he admits that that's that's not the the best way to to do it i think that's that might be damaging okay um i'm thinking the church in this story of the church yeah yeah uh, uh well mm, that's that's probably a, a, a separate topic because uh, well I, once again as a political theorist I'm developing a political theological interpretation of uh, uh, of the whole system uh, and uh, for this political theological interpretation of course uh, you need to um, to have a presidential figure like completely removed uh, from from the profane world uh, of of mundane politics. And this is why he is staying, he's standing above the politics. And this is why, for instance, uh, he would never, uh, never mention Alexei Navalny, who was obviously his main opponent. He couldn't, uh, because Navalny belongs to the way of, of the profane, uh, to the world of the profane. And Putin, of course, belongs to the, to, the, to the world of the sacred. And this is where he needs the support from the church. Uh, he's been getting it uh, for a while. Uh, then, Apparently, uh, there was a kind of uh, um, relations between between the patriarch, uh, the patriarch, and the the president uh, cooled down. Uh, now, what we're seeing is that uh, 
apparently uh, the administration is promising something to to the patriarch and to uh, to the clergy in order for them to uh, to campaign for for the uh, for the constitutional reform they already started doing that uh, but in general i would say that the relations are pretty tense uh, partly i mean the, the the people in inside the church uh, are very well seen very well that uh, the closer they become to uh, to the president the stronger is the uh, is the role of um, of conservative and military part of of the clergy and they're pretty dangerous people uh, they're probably the minority but they're pretty dangerous people and they get in the upper hand uh, so the part what what doesn't want to be, become a hostage to to that part of the the clergy elite uh, and he has already lost uh, ukraine over over the whole thing uh, and that's of course Precisely because uh, of of the choice he was he was made to to make between the his political uh, uh, loyalties and his uh, clerical loyalties, so uh, that that is a price to be paid. And now the clergy is aware of that, so the the relations are rather tense. But still, uh, from political theological viewpoint, uh, this president, of course, needs at least certain support from from the church. Otherwise, uh, th this is this is part of the legitimacy that he needs. So, so I'll you share for a moment and ask you about something, if I may, that you um, posted, I think, on Facebook yesterday or the other day, uh, which was a story, if I recall, about um, a doctor or somebody else working, I think it was at a hospital, um, and there was some sense that they were being pressured, as you mentioned, right, uh, through the workplace to, uh, to turn out votes. Um, and rather than just um, sort of accept it, right, um, uh, they, they pursued a rather different response. And I wonder whether you might share that story uh, with the group and, and, and what you think it tells us. Yes, well, the the pressure now is once again, as as I said, is unprecedented. Uh, it is even even higher than what we had two years ago uh, during these um, presidential elections, when for the first time, once again, the task was to to reach the the fifty percent threshold, and. Uh, even then, the, the pressure was already very, very high on everyone, uh, uh, on, on, not only on state, uh, uh, on civil servants, on uh, those affiliated with the state, but also people who are dependent on the states in any, in, in any way. For instance, on huge uh, enterprises who have the contracts from the state. So now the pressure is even higher. And uh, those people who are pressured now, uh, they are required not only to uh, to go and, and, and vote, but also to bring three or four um, people with them. Uh, and that, 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 of course, because the resources are much lower. But the first, first of all, the, uh, the initial situation is much uh, more difficult for, for the president and the resources are much lower now. Uh, and this is why they are doing all they can uh, to to mobilize to mobilize the people, and this is how they're starting to reach the people who are who, ne who never were too loyal to the president, but who are uh, already becoming uh, his opponents. Well, they're not strictly opponents, but they're uh, at least opposed to to the whole idea of extending his limits forever, uh, and uh, that 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 creates a clash. So the, the pressure is even higher and it is reaching now the people who are uh, who shouldn't be uh, who shouldn't be pressured uh, in order to to avoid um, a backlash. So the backlash is partly happening now. Uh, the example of this of this doctor from from Kirov region, but also of certain of some people from Moscow, from St. Petersburg, uh, it already uh, demonstrates that um, well, the, the readiness for the backlash is, is pretty high. And given that they are now reaching people who don't uh, feel dependent that much, uh, the, the probability of, of getting a huge backlash is higher. Uh, well, uh, what I think that means, uh, besides the, the fact that uh, the resources are very, very scarce, and that's actually the, 
the desperate effort to draw everyone in. Uh, so besides that, I think uh, it will create further alienation. I don't think that there will be uh, a real, real uh, resistance uh, to, to those pressures right now. But uh, what I do think is that, that, that the, uh, the next elections, next time, uh, Putin will need these, the, those numbers. And once again, the, every time he, the, the numbers must be higher, not lower. Because otherwise, uh, this is the the symptom of legitimacy decreasing. So next time, Putin will need those numbers. Uh, the probability of uh, real resistance will will increase. Okay, um, I want to thank you for that. I think there's, there's a lot of other directions this uh, this conversation can uh, can go. I think we will certainly return to it um, over time. Uh, but we've taken uh, an hour and a half of your time this evening, and and. Uh, this is uh, sometimes a rather trying format in which to uh, to sit still and stare at a screen for a while. Um, so I will um, uh, draw this to a close. If I can ask everybody to join me in a, a virtual uh, a round of applause and thanks for uh, for Greg Uden and thank you for uh, joining us from uh, from Moscow. Uh, it is summer, but we're not going to adjourn uh, entirely. So we're going to come back to the. Um, uh, to, to you with an invitation uh, very shortly for uh, our next conversation, which uh, I think will be with uh, Ivan Kurila from the European University in St. Petersburg, and we'll talk about how events in the United States uh, are reflected in uh, the mirror of the Russian uh, public. public. And vice versa. And vice versa. Uh, thank you. Thank you for, for having me. It was a pleasure to, to be with you. Thank you for a very interesting questions. Uh, was a real pleasure to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. Stay healthy. You too. You too.